thank you very much for your time today. The title of this dissertation is The Seismic Response of Freestanding Structural Systems, Shake Table Tests, and Model Validation. And in today's presentation, I will begin by detailing the motivation as well as some previous research in the area of freestanding structural systems, followed by three distinct phases of the research, namely a field assessment and survey of representative systems, followed by two phases of shake table testing, and ultimately the development and validation of a numerical model for the seismic response of freestanding structural systems. So I'll begin with just a brief introduction to freestanding structural systems. And these systems are defined as any structure or component that is unanchored and is further limited in this dissertation to rigid components and structures. So this class of structures includes a wide variety of both everyday and critical systems. In particular, a number of building contents, including electrical and laboratory equipment, are included in this class of structures. One example is provided on the lower right-hand side, which is an electrical transformer. And should this transformer be damaged during an earthquake, can reduce the functionality of the facility that it supports. In addition, heritage structures and cultural heritage encompass a very wide portion of this type of structures. Uh, one common example is the classical multi-drum column, which is shown in the upper right-hand side. And this consists of a series of stacked squat cylindrical blocks, which are unattached at their interfaces. Another common example is the large stone statue pedestal system shown on the lower left-hand side, where this statue is not only asymmetric, but is resting unattached on top of a pedestal, which is further unattached on top of the loggia or a museum floor. Not only are these objects critical or potentially irreplaceable, they've been observed to perform quite poorly during earthquakes. So this slide presents a handful of post-earthquake reconnaissance images following the 2011 Christchurch earthquake. And on the left-hand side is an example of an overturned and a damaged utility tank, which now reduces the functionality of the facility that it supports. The central image highlights the collapse of unreinforced masonry blocks, where each of the individual masonry blocks can be considered a freestanding structure. And the overturning of one, or the collapse of the wall, not only causes this uh, facility to be red tagged, but also can cause injury or loss of life to any of the occupants during the earthquake itself. And on the far right hand side is an example of an overturned and a damaged statue in a plaza, which I'll emphasize again, these culturally significant statues can be considered uh, unique and irreplaceable. A more recent set of examples comes from the 2014 South Napa earthquake, of which I was a member of the post-earthquake reconnaissance team focused on these freestanding structural systems. On the left-hand side is an electrical transformer, which did not overturn or collapse during the earthquake, but rather twisted and translating, causing it to be red-tagged. And the left central image is a fairly tall and quite asymmetric modern art object. Again, this system did not overturn during the earthquake, but rather it twisted about 30 degrees about the vertical. This is compared to the right central image, which again is quite tall, but fairly symmetric, and did overturn during the earthquake, causing damage to the surrounding walls and windows. And on the far right is again another example of the overturned statue pedestal system. However, it's interesting to note that this statue was originally facing away from the building, indicating that at some point during its earthquake excitation, it twisted about 180 degrees about the vertical before landing face down in the mulch. And so these sets of post-earthquake reconnaissance images not only highlight the wide variety of components within this class of structures, but also the wide variety of failure and response modes that are possible in the event of an earthquake. And so in summary, freestanding structural systems represent a very wide variety of both everyday and critical systems. They tend to perform quite poorly during earthquakes, which can lead to the loss of irreplaceable heritage, reduced functionality for a critical facility, and even loss of life in the event of unreinforced masonry. And so therefore, a critical need has been identified for the accurate prediction of the seismic response of freestanding structural systems. 
However, existing analysis methods are really quite limited. So what's shown on the bottom of this slide is the schematic and the equations of motion for the rotation of a two-dimensional rigid rocking block. Now referring to these equations of motion, it is first highlighted that this is nonlinear with respect to geometric parameters, as seen by this cosine alpha term. We're referring to the schematic, this alpha term is a slenderness or an aspect ratio type quantity. The equation of motion for the rocking, which again is shown here by this theta term or rotation about its base, is further parameterized by a rocking radius or a size type parameter r, as well as the mass and the mass moment of inertia. This equation of motion is valid for rotation about the given or shown rocking point. And once a peak is reached and the block falls back into contact with the foundation, it will then begin ro rocking or rotating about the opposite rocking point. Hence, the piecewise nature shown by the signum function. And at this point of impact, all of the energy dissipation is typically assumed and modeled with a coefficient of restitution shown by the R equation at the bottom. And again, this uh, coefficient of restitution, as well as the equation of motion, are both nonlinear with respect to geometric parameters, yet have been derived assuming a fairly simplistic geometry, including two distinct points of rocking at the base. And while simplistic, this model has been extended to account for a variety of more advanced scenarios, including additional modes such as sliding, three-dimensional bodies or input motions, flexibility of the body or the foundation, and even to account for stacked bodies, such as the dual body formulation. And while these extensions are critical to understanding the impact of these individual variations, each one is not only cumbersome, but not cumulative. And realistic structures would require models that are able to account for each of these individual extensions. Furthermore, these analytical models have not been validated with respect to a substantial experimental database. Two of the foremost studies of which are highlighted on the right-hand side, including a, sta um, a systems of tall rectangular stones, as well as a series of squat cylindrical blocks in a stacked formation. And so therefore, there are three primary research objectives that are addressed in this dissertation. The first is to identify a realistic range of geometry, including the most extreme configurations with a focus on cultural heritage systems. The second is to then generate a database of experimental responses across the broad range of anticipated geometries via shake table testing. And the ultimate objective of this dissertation is to then develop and validate a numerical model which can sufficiently predict the seismic response of freestanding structural systems. And with that, I will begin detailing the first phase of research, of which the primary goal was to quantify the geometries of a range of freestanding structures. Given that the nonlinearity of this system is associated with the geometric parameters, the initial target is the geometrically complex large stone statue pedestal system. And in order to capture the geometries of these complex systems, a combination of light detection and ranging, or LIDAR scanning, as well as the computer vision technique known as structure for motion, were incorporated in a field survey. The results of these techniques both yield a three-dimensional point cloud, or a set of vertices describing the surface of the object, which can ultimately be post-processed into a surface mesh for the computation and analysis of the relevant geometric and mass properties. Specifically, LiDAR is an active remote sensing technique, which emits either a continuous wave or discrete pulses of laser light, which are then reflected based on physical objects in its line of sight, as shown schematically on the right-hand side. The range to or the distance to each of these individual reflections is then based on either the time of flight or the phase shift of that reflection. Specifically for the unit utilized in this survey, approximately one million points were able to be acquired per second at approximately millimeter to centimeter accuracy. This was compared to the passive line of sight technique known as structure from motion which is a family of computer algorithms which detects and tracks features or sets of pixels within a combined set of two-dimensional photographs or images. 
The tracking of these features then allows the camera positions to be triangulated and subsequently a point cloud to be developed. And in comparison to the aforementioned LiDAR technique, this is a relatively low cost and easy to implement system, hence its attraction. Geometric data was acquired in this fashion for 25 representative statue systems in Florence, Italy and San Francisco, California. In this, each target statue was scanned or photographed from multiple viewpoints to minimize occlusion. Then the individual scans were merged, or the SFM algorithm was run, to form a unified point cloud in a global coordinate system. Subsequently, triangulation of this point cloud was then conducted to yield a watertight or a fully enclosed surface mesh, as shown on the bottom two videos on the lower right hand side, which can subsequently be used for the computation of the relevant geometric and mass properties. However, as can be seen in the images at right, results from structure from motion and LIDAR appear quite different, with significant holes as well as increased surface noise noted for the structure from motion results compared to the near image-like results of the light detection and ranging shown at the bottom. However, the primary uh, analysis of this survey regarded the geometric parameters. And in that, structure from motion was able to match the LIDAR results with an approximately 20% in terms of both the mass moment of inertia as well as in terms of the rocking radius. And furthermore, was able to match the LIDAR in terms of the slenderness or aspect ratio with an approximately 10%. And therefore, this survey emphasized the need to use LIDAR for a statue or a structure specific analysis but the ability to incorporate both techniques when looking at a general range of the systems. The results of this statue survey emphasized a quite significant variation in terms of the aspect ratio as well as in terms of the eccentricity of these statues. So shown on the upper right hand side is a general or an arbitrary two-dimensional statue schematic. And this is characterized by a single value of the height to the center of mass as well as multiple values of the width to the center of mass, B. The ratio of these two then yields an aspect ratio or a slenderness type quantity, and the ratio of these can then be considered a measurement of the eccentricity. And these are plotted against one another on the lower right hand scatter plot. And while no distinct trend is observed, nor would one be anticipated given this non-engineered or artistic system, the scatter plot does serve to emphasize the wide variation of geometries encountered. With aspect ratios down to a value of about 1.5 or fairly squat and square in shape, all the way up to aspect ratios approaching 10, so exceedingly tall. Furthermore, eccentricities were seen down to about 0.3. This indicates that one width to the center of mass, B1, is only 30% that of the opposite B2, therefore a very highly eccentric configuration. And so therefore, moving forward to shake table testing, a very wide range of asymmetric geometric configurations must be incorporated. And with the results of this field survey, the design of the experimental portion of this dissertation will now be documented. Given the results of the field survey, the shake table tests were further guided by this complex statue pedestal system and is shown on the right hand side with a statue like structure sitting on top of a pedestal on the uniaxial shaking table facility at UC San Diego. This statue like structure was designed as a geometrically variable tower which was designed such that it could account for over 85% of the geometric configurations or statues surveyed in the field. And this is shown in the central scatter plots in terms of size parameters such as the height to the center of mass and the rocking radius, as well as with respect to aspect ratio and slenderness type quantities. Where the range of the statue-like specimen is shown in gray and the individual surveyed statues are, are overlaid and plotted in the blue data points. The stiff steel tower or statue-like specimen is shown again on the left-hand side. This was reconfigured with weight plates 
shown hung here in a tall and symmetric fashion, but which could be hung in a variety of symmetric and asymmetric configurations, accounting for both low and high center of masses. This stiff steel tower was further outfitted with a concrete marble base, which was resting unanchored on top of a fixed marble slab atop the uniaxial shaking table. The central image shows the weight plates of this specimen sh shown hung again in a uh, very tall configuration, yet also very asymmetric. This configuration further overturned or collapsed, which engaged the safety catch system shown on the upper portion of the image. And this safety catch system allowed each of these geometric configurations to rotate past its point of instability, effectively collapsing, while still allowing for rapid succession of multiple tests. This overturning can be considered an excessive rocking mode in this presentation, shown here as a theta xz or a rotation in plane, compared to a sliding or a displacement or translation in the direction of the motion, as well as a twisting type mode, where each of these individual modes will be shown in video form in just a few slides. This geometrically variable tower specimen was reconfigured to form 15 unique single body tests, where a single body test is shown on the right hand image consisting of the tower specimen resting atop the shaking table top. These 15 configurations accounted for three levels to the height to the center of mass, as well as three levels of eccentricity, both in the direction of motion as well as perpendicular to the direction of the shaking table motion. A subset of four of these single body configurations were tested in a dual body system, where the dual body system is shown in the leftmost image consisting of the tower resting unattached or unanchored atop of a pedestal, which is subsequently resting unanchored atop of the shaking table floor. These 12 dual body systems consisted of four tower configurations, as well as two geometries of the pedestal and two levels of interface material or level of friction at the individual interfaces. However, due to time considerations, only the in-plane geometric variations will be discussed in this presentation. Each of the single and dual body configurations were tested to a minimum of five dynamic base excitations consisting of recorded earthquake motions, including far field or broadband motions, near field or pulse like motions, including significant durations from three seconds all the way up to and exceeding 50 seconds. The test program was further augmented with free rocking tests without shaking table input, as well as variable velocity sliding tests to account for the level of friction at the individual interfaces. Throughout the course of testing, three primary modes and three interactive modes were observed in the individual single body tests. The primary modes are shown as the top row of videos and the interactive modes which occurred in over 30% of all single body tests are shown as the bottom row of videos. The first primary mode consists of rocking, which shows rocking or pivoting about an individual edge followed by impact and pivoting or rotation about the opposite edge of the specimen. This is compared to the sliding mode, which consists of translation in the direction of the shaking table motion, as well as the twisting mode, which consists of a rotation about the vertical axis of the tower. However, it should be noted that this twisting mode was always evidenced or observed in some kind of a combination or an interactive mode. However, it is separated here for purposes of analysis. The first of the interactive modes is shown here as slide rocking, which consists of simultaneous sliding and rocking response, where this body initiates into an uplifted orientation and then slides or translates in the direction of motion. However, this video further highlights a modal transition, where this body initiates into a slide rocking mode and then transitions to a rocking, purely rocking type of a mode. The second of these interactive modes was the rock twisting, which is shown here as primarily rocking but incrementally becoming more twisted about the vertical on an individual or a given impact event. 
And the final is the slide twisting mode, where the body is not only sliding in the direction of the shaking table motion, but also twisting about the vertical axis. In addition to the observation of the aforementioned modes, the individual geometric configurations can be further compared into the, according to the likelihood or the magnitude to respond in a given motion. So the scatter plots on the bottom of this slide show a general overview of the single body tests, where the x-axis can be considered an amplification ratio, which takes the peak rocking rotation or the peak sliding displacement of a highly eccentric configuration and normalizes it by the corresponding response of the symmetric counterpart subject to the same excitation motion. This indicates that values greater than 1 state that the eccentric configuration responded with a greater magnitude, and data points less than 1 indicate that the symmetric configuration responded with a greater magnitude in the given mode. These scatter plots are further categorized according to the direction of response, where a peak negative rotation as well as a peak positive displacement are both taken out for comparison, whereas shown on the upper right hand side, the eccentricity is always provided in the negative direction. The plots are further categorized along the y-axis according to the height to the center of mass or the size of the bodies. And I'd just like to single out two primary observations which can then be studied in terms of time history and video forms. First, directing your attention to h equals 0.75 or the fairly squat or low height to the center of mass configurations. Referring to the rocking plot, a very significant over 400 percent increase in terms of the rocking demands is observed. This is shown on the right hand side by a corresponding reduction in terms of the sliding demands for these squatter type configurations. On the contrary, referring to H equals 1.45 or fairly tall or high heights to the center of mass configurations, a much more mild increase in terms of the rocking demands is noted of about 150 percent. And referring to the sliding demands, a quite significant increase in the sliding demands is noted. However, it should be observed that this increase in the sliding demands is occurring in the direction opposite of the eccentricity, which is now shown in terms of time history forms, where each of these plots represents the rocking, the sliding, or the twisting over time for a given geometric configuration, where on both sides of this slide, the response of the symmetric body is provided in a thick line, for instance cayenne on the left, and overlaid with the response of the eccentric configuration in a thinner line, where this is shown on the left hand side in blue shades for those configurations with a low height to the center of mass, and on the right hand side for configurations with a higher height to the center of mass. Now first referring to the plots on the left, it can be seen that the bulk of the symmetric response in the, thick, in the thick cayenne line is concentrated in terms of a primarily sliding and a mild twisting type of a response. However, as the mass shifts horizontally and becomes more asymmetric or eccentric, not only are the twisting and the sliding demands significantly reduced or effectively removed, the body becomes significantly rocking dominated and actually collapses and overturns. On the contrary, referring to the plots on the right hand side, the symmetric, shown in the thick orange line, is evidenced by multiple cycles of a rocking response with fairly little in terms of the other modes. However, this eccentric configuration shows not only an increased rocking response, but also an increase in terms of the sliding and the twisting demands emphasizing the vulnerability of these already slender components, which can now be seen in a video format where the left hand side takes this tall symmetric configuration and the right hand side subject to the same ground motion, this taller eccentric configuration. And both appear to be quite rocking dominated, however I'll draw your attention to the bottom right hand image of the interface of the tall eccentric configuration, which at the conclusion of the motion emphasizes how much displacement had actually accumulated over the given motion. 
Building upon the results of these single body tests, this slide presents an overview of the, of the dual body testing results. The scatter plots on this slide take the peak rocking rotation or the peak sliding displacement of a given tower to a given motion as a single body system. This is plotted against on the uh, y-axis or on the left hand side according to the response of the same tower to the same motion but in a dual body system. The individual tower is denoted by the marker where the more square markers uh, emphasize the squatter or the lower height to the center of mass configurations and the circular targets emphasize these higher height to the center of mass systems. These scatter plots are further divided with a bold one-to-one -one line, emphasizing that data points in the upper left-hand quadrant indicate that the tower responded with greater magnitude atop of a pedestal in a dual body configuration, and points on the lower right-hand quadrant are indicating that the tower responded with a greater magnitude in this mode as a single body. And again, I'd just like to point out two primary observations from these scatter plots, which can then be studied in terms of time history and video formats. So first referring to the squat symmetric or the red square marker with a fairly low height to the center of mass. Referring first to the rocking demands, we can see a very significant and a steep increase in terms of these rocking rotation. Again, emphasizing a likely mode shift where the single body system has already been observed to be quite sliding dominated. And this makes sense given the fact that this system center of mass is now going to be quite taller as a dual body system. However, drawing your attention to the magenta crosshatched marker for the squat eccentric body, what can be seen in terms of the rocking is that as a single body, this system was quite vulnerable to overturning with three instances shown on this plot of overturning for this given configuration. However, when this body is now placed into a dual body configuration, effectively raising this system's center of mass, an increase in the stability or a reduction in the rocking demands is actually observed. And this corresponds to an increase in terms of its sliding demands, which can now be seen in terms of time history formats. Where for each of these rocking, sliding, and twisting time histories, the response of the tower as a single body is outlined in the red dashed line and overlaid with the response of this tower atop of a pedestal in a gray line and the response of the pedestal itself in the background as the thicker black line. And this is shown on the left hand for the squat symmetric tower and compared on the right hand side outlined in red with the response of the tall symmetric tower both atop the same pedestal subject to the same input motion. First referring to the left hand side to the squat symmetric tower. What can be seen is that the single body has a primarily twisting, uh, primarily sliding as well as the twisting type of response. However, as a dual body, the system actually initiates into a mode of rotation at the base or a rotation at the base of the pedestal. And this is due to the fact that now with a body on top of this pedestal, the system is actually quite slender and is now the critical system. And then this pre-rotated orientation as shown in the schematic at the top, then allows this tower to essentially be thrown into a free rocking type of a mode rather than dominated by sliding. This is uh, compared or rather contrasted on the right hand side with the results of the tall symmetric tower where as a single body, this tower is quite rocking dominated. And when it's placed into the dual body configuration is already the critical system and is essentially initiated into a rocking on top of the pedestal rather than a rotation at the base of the pedestal. However, the time history results for rocking of the single body specimen compared to its response atop of the pedestal are still quite different emphasizing the impact or the importance of even minor motions of the pedestal and the result that that can have on the dynamic response of the tower on top, which can now be seen in terms of a video form, where the left-hand side takes the response of this sliding-dominated single body 
and then compares it on the right hand side to the rocking dominated motion of this tower on top of the pedestal, where I'll draw your attention to the interface of the pedestal, where this includes a very mild rotation at the base of this pedestal and a subsequently significant free rocking motion of the tower itself. Recall that the second primary observation was the increased stability of the squat eccentric body as a dual body system. To study this further, the response of this tower as a single body is shown on the uppermost uh, at the right hand side as a single body. And what's observed is that it does overturn. However, it does so only after multiple impacts with its foundation, where these impacts are considered zero crossings of the time history or a rotation or uplift against the opposite rocking point. Compared to the result as a dual body, we actually see that it achieves an initial peak rotation that's nearly double that of what's achieved as a single body, around three, three and a half seconds, where the dual body system achieves about 11 degrees, where the single body system achieves only about six degrees. However, after the first impact event, the single body pivots significantly or rebounds. Whereas on top of the dual body system, most of the motion is effectively died out at that point. However, upon a closer inspection as shown in the detailed inlet, as well as in the schematic at the bottom, it can be seen that at the point of impact or collision, the pedestal is rotating up. So effectively, there are two bodies which are moving in two opposite directions and can effectively cancel out the majority of the energy contained in this system which can now be seen in terms of a frame by frame video, where each of these individual frames are at the same time step, and it can be seen the negative angular velocity of the tower, positive motion of the pedestal. After the impact, it can then be seen how much slower the entire motion of the combined system is moving compared to before the initial impact. And so in conclusion of these experimental results, it was observed that geometric asymmetry can cause distinct variations not only in the magnitude of response but also in terms of the response mode itself. And so therefore, a numerical model must account for these three-dimensional bodies and three-dimensional response, including complex or precise geometries. Second, multiple modes were frequently observed, including both modal interaction and modal transition. And therefore, the modeling scheme must allow for both these primary and interactive modes to freely transition within a given simulation. And third, a dual body or a multi-body system may act markedly different than its corresponding single body system in terms of both the response mode, the response magnitude, as well as in terms of the energy dissipation. And so therefore, multi-body systems must be solved accounting for each part or each component's distinct motion and the complex interactions at the given interfaces. And with that, I will detail the primary modeling aspect of this dissertation. However, I'd like to begin with a brief study of the applicability of the analytical models first detailed at the beginning of this presentation. So again, on the left-hand side of this slide shows the equation of motion and schematic for an arbitrary two-dimensional rigid rectangular block. For a representative geometric configuration, this was numerically integrated and plotted against the freestanding or the free rocking type of a response of the specimen. And a very poor agreement is noted, both in terms of the post-impact amplitude as well as in terms of the rate of decay where this classical model predicts that the rocking motion would die out by around two seconds, yet the experimental specimen continues motion for almost four seconds. And I'll note that the classical model and the experiment show very good agreement prior to the first zero crossing or impact event. And this indicates that the primary geometric parameters, the rocking radius, slenderness, and the mass moment of inertia have all been correctly incorporated into this equation of motion. This then leaves the treatment of impact or the coefficient of restitution as the primary source of this disagreement. 
where what can be seen in the video on the lower right hand side is that the experimental specimen had an effective warp or effectively the introduction of additional rocking points at its interface due to inherent variability in the marble surface where these rocking points are clearly not accounted for in this two-dimensional schematic shown on the right-hand side. And so to address this, a novel extension to the analytical model was derived to account for a warped interface and the inclusion of an arbitrary number of rocking points at the base of a rocking block. The classical equations of motion for the 2D two-point model are again shown on the left-hand side and compared on the right-hand side with the newly derived model, accounting for an arbitrary number of rocking points. The equation of motion as shown was derived in a similar fashion, including a Newtonian formulation, as well as the conservation of angular momentum to derive the coefficient of restitution. And while the equation of motion appears quite similar to the original model, the individual geometric parameters, shown here by R and by alpha, are no longer a function of the block's geometry and are rather more specific to the given rocking point at that point in the time history. The primary difference between the classical model and the newly derived arbitrary model arises from, again, the treatment of impact or the coefficient of restitution. Where the classical model emphasizes that this is with respect to the geometry of the entire block, on the right-hand side, the equation now emphasizes that it is not only a function of the geometry at the point of impact, but also a function of the geometry of the previous rocking point. And given that these intermediary rocking points can be effectively much more slender than its two-point model counterparts, this coefficient can be anticipated to increase when having a warped interface and subsequently reducing the rate of decay which is shown on this slide in terms of the previous example for the free rocking motion. We're on the top right plot. The results of the free rocking experimental specimen are shown in the thicker gray line, overlaid with the results of the classical model, again shown in red, and then also overlaid in black with the results of the extended analytical model accounting for a warp at the interface, where this warp is shown at the bottom right hand schematic showing the warp incorporated for a third rocking point and a vertical difference of one millimeter. And while this warp can be considered quite small, the impact or the improvement in agreement is quite significant. And this is emphasized at the individual impacts according to the angular velocity time history, where the coefficient of restitution or this instantaneous reduction in the angular velocity can be shown for the classical model as 0.7 and for the extended analytical model as 0.85. And this indicates that the classical model assumes that 70% of the angular velocity will remain following an impact event, where the extended analytical model states that at least 85% of the angular velocity will remain following a given impact event where this can be seen in the detailed inset of the angular velocity time history, showing a very significant reduction in the angular velocity in red for the classical model, and a much more mild reduction in terms of the black for the extended analytical model, thus able to match the free rocking experimental specimen in terms of both the post-impact amplitude as well as in terms of the rate of decay. And so therefore, moving forward, the numerical models need to be able to account for an arbitrary interface geometry as well as the complex multimodal and multibody behavior that was observed in the experimental portion of this dissertation. And so to address this, the numerical model was developed in the explicit multi-physics solver LS Dyna. In this model, the individual structures, whether this is the tower, the pedestal, or the foundation, were modeled as three-dimensional, discrete, rigid entities, where the geometry can be incorporated using brick-type elements or through a direct implementation of the center of mass and inertial properties. Therefore, the model is able to account for the precise and complex geometries of the body and of the interface 
as was dictated by the experimental portion of this dissertation. The interaction between the individual entities utilized a penalty-based contact algorithm, which is shown schematically on the upper right-hand side. And this indicates that at every time step in the simulation, there is a search for penetration of the nodes of one body into the elements of another corresponding body. And at this time and only at these specific locations are spring and dash pot type elements generated to repel the penetration and create forces of contact between the bodies, where these forces of contact are then used to solve for the acceleration of the individual bodies and subsequently for the velocity and displacement and the updated position of each of the individual bodies, which can then lead to the next search for penetration of nodes at the next given time step. The numerical model further incorporated a rigid material model, and thus calibration of these material properties was not required. In addition, the geometric properties of an individual configuration were specified from the individual experimental configurations. And further, all configurations incorporated a known interface warp. This leaves the remaining contact parameters to be fitted to the individual configurations based on the free rocking or sliding tests. And this was done in terms of the interface stiffness, the contact damping ratio, as well as in terms of the frictional interface coefficients. This process yielded a configuration-specific model, which can then be compared to the dynamic response subject to an earthquake motion. And this is seen here in terms of a general overview, where the peak rocking or the peak sliding for the experimental configuration is plotted against its numerical prediction on the y-axis. Referring first to the results of the rocking, a fairly one-to-one -one line can be seen with fairly good predictability according to the 0.88 R-squared value. However, this is contrasted on the right-hand side with increased scatter according to the sliding demands, where this increased scatter can be partially attributed to the continually evolving friction interface, including both the creation of as well as the smoothing of asperities in the marble due to both the rocking impacts and the sliding displacement. However, there are a number of noticeable outliers as shown by these red X points. And these outliers are attributed to cases of near collapse or overturning situations, which is a known point of instability for these types of rocking or freestanding structures. These configuration specific models were further compared for the ability of the numerical model to represent the modal interaction or the multimodal behavior that was observed during the experimental phases. These modal interaction plots shown on the bottom of this slide take the sliding, the rocking, or the twisting response of a given configuration and plot them against one another in time, beginning at a value of zero, zero. And what can be seen from these modal interaction plots is the ability of the numerical model, as shown in the overlaid red line for prediction, is that this model can effectively reproduce the slide rocking, the twist sliding, as well as the rock twisting interactive modes. However, referring to the leftmost plot for the slide rocking, it can be seen that not only can the model reproduce the interactive modes, but can also sufficiently incorporate modal transitioning, which was again another significant experimental outcome, where both the experimental body and the numerical model, as shown here, initiates into a rocking mode, transitions into the simultaneous slide rocking mode, and then ultimately transitions back into a purely rocking mode. In addition to the model's multimodal ability, further comparisons were made in terms of the model's ability to represent the complex multi-body behavior. And so on this slide, the response of the pedestal is shown in the top row, and the response of the tower itself are shown as the bottom row, separated for each of the individual primary modes of response. And these are overlaid with the experimental response for that component in that mode in a gray line and overlaid again with the configuration-specific model prediction in the overlaid red line. 
And the, these plots emphasize that the numerical model is able to account for all of the primary modes of both of these distinct bodies. However, drawing your attention to the lower left side to the tower rocking time history, it's emphasized that the numerical model is able to achieve the large rotation, yet a safe return, of the rocking of this tower. And this, as a single body, would be responding with a much different time history, emphasizing the model's ability to account for even minor motions of the, of the pedestal or of the foundation itself. The final validation was with respect to the fundamental rocking dynamics, specifically the ability of the approximate or the numerical model to capture the variations associated with impacts at the intermediary rocking points. So the bottom of this slide presents again the experimental free rocking shown in a black line and is then overlaid with two variations of this numerical model where the configuration specific model incorporating the warped interface is shown in the green line and the response of the same numerical model yet incorporating a flat interface without the warp is shown in the red dashed line. And the results are very similar to the previous study for the classical model incorporating two rocking points where the numerical model including only two points shows an inability or a poor agreement in terms of both the post-impact amplitude as well as in terms of the rate of decay, with a much improved agreement shown for the numerical model incorporating that physically modeled warp. And so therefore, the developed numerical model in ls Dyna can sufficiently reproduce the fundamental rocking dynamics as well as the multimodal and complex multi-body behavior of freestanding structures. And so in summary, a critical need was identified to accurately predict the seismic response of freestanding structural systems. And to address this need, three primary objectives were outlined and addressed in this dissertation. The first was to identify a realistic range of anticipated geometries for freestanding systems. This was conducted through a field survey of 25 large complex statue pedestal systems. The results of this field survey emphasize the inability of structure from motion, or SFM, to yield highly accurate geometric parameters, which are needed for a rocking or a freestanding type of an analysis. The field survey further emphasized a very wide range of aspect ratios and eccentricities that can be encountered for freestanding structural systems. The results of this field survey then helped to guide two phases of shake table testing, which accounted for this very broad range of geometry. In these tests, mass eccentricities were shown to have a very significant impact, not only in terms of the response magnitude, but also in terms of the response mode. Furthermore, multiple modes and modal interaction were quite frequently observed, and this was significant even for cases of planar symmetry. Furthermore, dual body systems were shown that they can be considerably more stable than their single body counterparts. And the combined results of this database of experimental responses were then used to help develop and validate a multi-physics numerical model for the seismic response of freestanding structural systems. This model was developed in LS Dyna and is able to account for the distinct motion of each body in a system and was shown to effectively reproduce the multimodal and complex multi-body behavior of freestanding systems. This was further compared to the fundamental rocking dynamics and incorporated a novel derivation of an extended analytical model accounting for an arbitrary number of rocking points at the base of a rigid rocking body. And with that, I would like to acknowledge the support of the National Science Foundation for the primary funding for both the field survey as well as the experimental portions of this dissertation, as well as additional secondary experimental funding from UC San Diego and an NSF MRI award with material donations from EQX Global and the Florentine Stone Company. I would also like to acknowledge the support uh, for my graduate career from the NSF Eigert Fellowship the San Diego Diversity Fellowship, 
as well as the achievement rewards for college scientists and with partial support from the Qualcomm Institute at UC San Diego, the Friends of Chisa 3, and the World Cultural Heritage Society. I would also like to express my sincere gratitude to the committee in charge for their time and their dedication to my graduate career. In addition, I'd like to thank uh, and acknowledge the assistance of Drs. Maurizio Saracini and Richard Wood, as well as the staff of Palazzo Vecchio and the Opera del Duomo uh, during the field work portion of this dissertation. And I would also like to single out Mr. Darren McKay of the Charles Lee Powell Laboratory for his effort and dedication during the shake table testing phases, as well as the assistance of Sarah Grossi and Don Clyde. Uh, and with that, thank you very much for your time.